Okay, we're back. So now what we're doing is we're going to just kind of wrap up the chapter by talking about a few different sort of small little corners of organic chemistry that still involve chirality that we want to make sure you kind of understand before we move forward. Um, but we're going to kind of tuck them away. These, these are kind of in the corners of organic chemistry. And every so often we're going to run into these, but it's not going to be as common as what we saw before with uh, R versus S, for example optically active compounds. There is an important lab implication we'll talk about, but first what we want to do is just there's a couple little kinds of uh, uh, stereochemistry that show up in organic chemistry, and we just want to make sure you're aware of it when you do see it. So first up, uh, one thing is that uh, you can have uh, basically enantiomers that are conformationally mobile. So here we have a uh, butane, and uh, we just have two Newman projections of butane. And as you can see, sure enough, they're enantiomeric. And so if these were different compounds, you know, you think, okay, these are enantiomers. But of course, we know that uh, these sigma bonds can be rotated around freely. So they're not really enantiomeric, um, at least they're not really um, chiral, because they, they can just interchange between one another. There's just a simple rotation that occurs. So on the other hand, that does not happen for alkenes. Remember alkenes are, you cannot rotate around that pi bond. So therefore, you know, you can have uh, cis and trans isom isomers for, um, for alkenes. Um, that's also the case for dimethylcyclohexane here. This is cis 1,2 dimethylcyclohexane to be clear. This is a compound we talked about earlier. I think at the very beginning of the chapter, we had something like this. Anyways, uh, here what we have is we have two intergiverting chair conformations, and these are mirror images of one another, so they're enantiomeric, yet uh, the, uh, and we see that we would predict to have two chiral carbons here because two carbons are bonded to, you know, four different groups if you count them up, yet we know because there's a plane of symmetry in the molecule uh, that this is actually a meso compound, and because, uh, and, and, Kind of the reason for that is that these two can interconvert between one another and so you get this mirror plane of symmetry and it's a meso compound so overall there is no chirality in this compound okay so that's just like a couple things with rotation now one thing is you can actually if you can prevent a rotation of a sigma bond then you can actually have stereoisomers and this is one example of that this is what's called an etrope isomer uh, i've actually i don't I haven't heard anyone pronounce that for the last 10 years, so I hope I'm saying it right. Uh, it is a stereoisomer that would be interchangeable, like the two examples we just talked about, but the bond is stuck in one way or another. So for example here, this is uh, actually a very important um, molecule called BINAP. There's S BINAP and R BINAP. Um, and the thing is, uh, the reason that uh, BINAP can be S or R is because the sigma bond that would rotate around to interconvert between the two is actually stuck because these benzene rings, um, they both have hydrogen atoms sticking off the bottom here. So I can actually, let me draw that in to make sure it's, it's totally clear here. So there's a hydrogen atom here, and then there's another hydrogen all the way back here. Those are gonna hit one another. And you know what? Electrons are negatively charged. They're gonna repel each other. So as those carbon hydrogen bonds hit one another, they're gonna push each other back. And so you can't actually interconvert. So this uh, interconversion part doesn't occur. The other reason is you got these uh, diphenyls uh, on the phosphoruses up here. They're gonna run into one another. It's too sterically difficult for those to interconvert. So instead you just get S binap or R binap. So they're chiral, they're an antimers of one another. And uh, even though they don't have an, a chirality center, uh, we say instead they have an axis of chirality. That axis of chirality is that sigma bond um, that, cannot, uh, that cannot rotate freely around. Let's just clear that out. Now, BINAP is gonna become important because this is actually gonna be, we're gonna talk about one of the uses of chiral uh, compounds. And this is gonna be an important part of catalysts in the future when we wanna make just the R or just the S. It can be very difficult, but one thing you can do is if you use a chiral catalyst or if you use a chiral reactant, uh, that can influence the chirality of the product that you get. 
not 100%, but BINAP is one of the important compounds that will help us with that in the future. Okay, the next type of compound, and this is again kind of a rare compound, you don't see it that often, except sometimes I'll just draw one on the test. It's kind of interesting for a lot of different reasons. We actually had one of these, I forget if it was on the practice test or on our exam. Um, this is what's called an alene, which is where you have two carbon-carbon uh, double bonds in a row. So in other words, you have a central carbon that's uh, double bonded in both directions. And um, it's really interesting because the nature of it is this central carbon is sp hybridized and it's got two unhybridized p orbitals one has to be vertical and the other one has to be kind of like sticking out of the page here and so what that means is basically the one that's sticking out of the page and we'll just move to this next one is going to pi bond to its neighbor and then the one sticking out of the other one is going to pi bond to the other one that leaves us with two sp2 hybridized carbons on either side but those sp2 hybridized carbons are sp2 in different planes because they use different p orbitals, right? Here, this carbon had to leave its px orbital unhybridized to pi bond. And here, this carbon over here, it had to leave its pz orbital unhybridized. So it's sp2, but that sp2 is its 2s, its px, and its py. Whereas this one's sp2, but it's its s, uh, I'm sorry, it's, s, it's its 2s, it's 2p, uh, 2py, and 2pz. So those are different types of sp2s. It's very interesting. And what ends up happening is basically you get this alene in the middle, and then you have four substituents. Uh, one here, one here, one here, and one here. And guess what? That's almost tetrahedral in a way, right? If you look at it, think of this as like the central carbon, and it's like tetrahedral. You've got uh, one, uh, 120 degree bond angles here and 120 degree bond angles here. But the, the same is the, the truth is this alene unit can be bonded to four different compounds. And if it is, then it's chiral. So yeah, so you can actually have an antimers of one another for these alene compounds. Again, this is kind of unusual, like this is a relatively unstable type of compound, but it does show up every so often and it can be very useful. One thing about organic chemistry is like, in order to do interesting chemistry, you have to use these kind of unusual, like um, backdoor routes sometimes. And sometimes it can be very useful having a compound like an alene. Okay, so this is more of a lab talk. I mentioned earlier, 5.10, we talk about lab stuff. Um, basically, like, so, okay, so going back to our earlier discussion where we talked about, like, uh, sometimes having the, the right chirality is the cure and the wrong chirality is the poison, right? So R versus S can be life or death. And so, well, I mean, if you're doing chemistry, you're going to make mixtures of R and S isomers. So then the question becomes, how do you separate the R isomer from the S isomer? And um, now there, there's a couple different ways that you can do that. Now, most of the time when we do stuff in lab, like we're separating compounds that have different physical properties. So like distillation is there so that you can separate things that have different boiling points. Recrystallization, that's for separating things with different solubilities. But remember what we found out is that um, enantiomers uh, have the same physical properties. So they can't be separated by these normal methods. We have to come up with something different. Now, every so often you can get lucky. Like uh, in 1847, Louis Pasteur uh, was able to separate out a mixture of uh, tartaric acid salts, so tartrates. And uh, the way that he was able to do that, fortunately, was these different enantiomers actually ended up forming different morphology of their crystals. So the crystals look different. So you just put it under a microscope and then kind of painstakingly separate it out. Now, like imagine if we had to do that for every I don't know, um, Tylenol or every like um, estradiol or something like that. Like uh, you, there's not enough manpower in the world or, or, or human power in the world to like separate those out. And also most of the time, like the crystals aren't gonna even be different. So I was just kind of lucky. So instead what we can do is uh, we can use what's called a chiral resolving agent. What you do there is basically you uh, form a salt. So here we have an amine group. So that can form an ammonium salt with a, um, with an, a carboxylic acid becoming a carboxylate. And then down here we have the, the enantiomer, the other enantiomer uh, form this. Now all of a sudden, rather than being a pair of enantiomers, now we have a pair of diastereomers. And remember, diastereomers will have different physical properties. So now you can use things like chromatography. So 
uh, whether it's column chromatography or more likely something like high, uh, high pressure liquid chromatography, HPLC. That's a more likely method that you could use. But now you can actually separate it in that way where you couldn't before. Another thing you can do is actually use what's called a chiral adsorbent. So in your lab by now, hopefully you've at least seen what a, a column chromatography looks like. Now, normal column chromatography uses things like silica gel or alumina, which are not chiral. So those aren't good resolving agents for what you could use uh, for a chiral, a chiral separation. But you can actually come up with chiral adsorbents uh, that basically fill the column instead. And as we mentioned, the, the main difference between like an R and an S is how they're going to interact with other chiral substrates. So uh, if you use a chiral adsorbent, one, hopefully one enantiomer will stick on the column a little bit more than the other. So you can like dilute it out, uh, R and S in that way. And that's kind of the most common way that you use it. Um, and yeah, it says we use glass columns. That's kind of like the old way of doing it. Now, more commonly, you just purchase a column for your HPLC machinery. And we will be looking at HPLC machinery later on this semester in lab, um, at least virtually. Okay, next up, uh, E and Z designations for alkenes. So this is, I think this is the last part of it here, but um, one thing that we wanna kind of talk about is very briefly, we talked about cis trans notation for alkenes, but that's not actually gonna be how we use it most of the time. Um, in the end, sometimes like you don't have really uh, a, a method for, um, so for example, like if your, if your alkene is bonded to like four different things and it's not like a carbon on this side, carbon on this side, you can't really say what's cis and what's trans because like, what are you talking about? Is the fluorine cis to the nitrogen or is the nitrogen trans to the carbon? It's just not clear. So instead we use what's called EZ designation. So EZ notation. And we'll talk about what that means in a second. Again, cis and trans only works if we have like groups on each carbon uh, for the alkene. So, um, so how we do this is basically, we're gonna go back and do con e gold prelog designation basically for this. Only this time we look at each vinyl carbon. So we have the carbon here, we have the carbon here, and we're gonna designate its two substituents. So here we've got fluorine versus an ethyl group. So F versus C. F is a higher atomic number, so this is gonna get priority down here. So we're just gonna mark it, this is one and this is two. Okay, then on the other carbon that's in the alkene, we have nitrogen versus hydrogen. Well, hydrogen is the lightest atom, it's got atomic number one. So definitely nitrogen takes priority over hydrogen, that's two. So now we're only gonna consider the ones. Now in this case, the ones are on the same side. So just keep that in mind, the, the, most, the highest priority is on the same side. So, um, so here, since they're on the same side, we're gonna give it a Z designation, which is from German for zusammen. Zusammen in German means together. On the other hand, um, we could imagine the E designation, that's where the, the number one priorities are on either side. And that's E for Entgegen, which means opposite. So the way that I always remember this is, I remember that Z stands for the same side. So you say, oh, it's on the same side, the same side, it's Z. If it's on opposite sides, that's E. Um, and that's just kind of how I uh, keep that in mind. We're gonna do a bunch of this in a future chapter. So just kind of like review this now. Uh, you'll need to be able to tell what's an E and a Z in the future uh, and on this test that's coming up as well. So now I believe that does it for um, our stereoisomerism chapter. You've reached the end of chapter five. Practice more in the lecture exercise down below. That's gonna be very useful for you. And um, ask questions uh, in the Canvas discussion as well. Uh, I will be available as soon as possible to answer those and uh, I will be in touch. Okay, so bye-bye.